Here is an Apollo 7 progress report from NBC News, brought to you by Gulf Oil. I'm Frank McGee. Apollo 7 is now crossing the southern part of Mexico, ending its 137th revolution. The latest firing of the main engine has raised the high point of the orbit to 236 miles, the low point to 90. Commander Walter Schirra has told Mission Control that the crew has taken a lot of good pictures since leaving Cape Kennedy nine days ago, including some shots of the violet typhoons in the western Pacific, which had closed down that recovery area. Houston has told the astronauts that they should wear both flight suits and helmets for their landing in the Atlantic on Tuesday morning, but the final decision on that will be up to the crew. With less than two days remaining in the 11-day mission, all is going well. And that's the latest on Apollo 7. Stay tuned to NBC for continuing coverage of Apollo 7, brought to you by Gulf. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. This is Neil Boggs inviting you to meet the press. Meet the press, now celebrating its 20th year on television, and winner of every major award in its field is a public affairs presentation of NBC News. Meet the Press is brought to you by all state insurance companies, the good hands people who find new ways to bring you in good hands with all state. Our guest today on Meet the Press is presidential candidate George C. Wallace, former governor of Alabama. His American Independent Party has become the first significant third party movement since 1948. We'll have the first questions for Mr. Wallace from Lawrence E. Spivak, permanent member of the Meet the Press panel. Uh, Governor Wallace, your running mate, General LeMay, has just returned from Vietnam after a visit of about three days. Did he bring back anything of importance that you didn't know or believe before he left? Well, of course, I can't answer as to whether he brought anything back uh, that's not known. I don't know what all is known about the matter in Vietnam. I had a short briefing with the general this morning he's going to have a news conference tomorrow but he does say that there's a very significant build-up of material and supplies coming from the Chinese border uh, to the 19th parallel that since the unrestricted uh, since the uh, stopping of the bombing above the 19th parallel uh, it now takes only six or eight days to bring supplies from the Chinese border uh, to the parallel, and then uh, from there they're going into the south, through the, D the DMZ and into the south. And uh, it used to take 100 days uh, when the bombing was going on. And so he doesn't think that the bombing, from his observation and what he has heard, uh, has, of course, uh, done anything but uh, allow uh, the North Vietnamese and the communists to build up. Governor. And he doesn't believe from that that the, those in Paris are negotiating in good faith, that is, the North Vietnamese. Governor, uh, today's New York Times quotes General LeMay as saying that he will present you with a, and uh, the words are his, sensible, proper, and efficient solution to the war. Did he present any solution to you for the war? Well, of course, I told you that we had a brief conference and we're going to have a further conference. I'm sorry that the time element was such that I have not been able to talk at length with General LeMay, but I think General LeMay's position is still the same as my position, or my position is the same as his, uh, that we pray that uh, there are honorable negotiations in Paris, that the war can be concluded in that fashion in an honorable manner, and the American servicemen come home. But that he doesn't believe that the North Vietnamese are negotiating in good faith, as witness the build-up down to the 19th parallel, which indicates that they are thinking about further military operations. And I understand that even further military hardware has come south uh, from the 19th parallel and also there above the 19th parallel. So I think that he still believes, I know he believes, as I do, that if we fail in Paris, we fail diplomatically and politically. And uh, then uh, there ought to be a military conclusion to the war uh, in Vietnam with conventional weapons and bring the American servicemen home. Well, he said, uh, or is reported to have said, that he still opposes any halt in the bombing of North Vietnam. Now, after hearing his personal report, 
Is that your position still, that you're against the bombing halt? Of course, if we have a bombing halt, I sincerely hope uh, that there are some reciprocal uh, concessions on the part of the North Vietnamese. I believe now they're talking about unannounced concessions, and I think any concession ought to be made public to the American people and the people of the world, and not any unannounced uh, uh, reciprocal agreements on the part of the North Vietnamese. Uh, so uh, he believes and still believes that uh, uh, they are not negotiating in good faith, and that uh, the war could be ended militarily. Uh, Governor, what did General LeMay report on the progress of the war? Did he say we're winning or losing or stalemated? Now, that's He's, something he must have he told sa you. He says that in the South, the, North, the South Vietnamese forces are in better shape than they've been in a long time, that the morale of the citizenry is probably higher than it has been in a long time, is my understanding, as a result of seeing the increased morale and effective... Uh, uh, fighting ability of the South Vietnamese uh, and that the Tet Offensive and the other two offensives in which they joined together for a conventional military assault upon Saigon was repulsed, uh, which also uh, helped the morale of those in South Vietnam. But he says that in the North, the build-up continues, that the piers have been repaired at Haiphong, uh, that uh, the roads have been rebuilt, and in places where they had one bridge over streams, they now have three bridges over streams, that they are more, they, uh, more effectively can they bring material and supplies uh, to the 19th parallel. And in his judgment, in answering your other question, the bombings have failed to bring about anything but a buildup of the North Vietnamese forces and the repairing of all the damage uh, that has occurred uh, from the bombing above the 19th parallel. And in my judgment, uh, and from what he said in my judgment, is that this has not been in the interest of the American servicemen. But again, I want to say that I don't impugn the motives of those in the top echelons of the government. It's a frustrating matter, this matter of Vietnam. I again say it ought to be ended one way or the other, through negotiations in Paris honorably, and if that doesn't come about, we ought to have a military victory because we're not going to stay in Vietnam forever and have hundreds of American servicemen killed each week in a no-win war, and we've been there, of course, longer than any war in our history. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be back with Meet the Press and more questions for our guest, George Wallace, but first, this message. All-state customer service. May we help you? Yes, uh, I've had an auto accident, but I've been out of town and haven't sent in my last All-state payment. Am I still covered? I'll see. May I have your insurance policy number, please? The uh, number on my card here is 02-228-615. Yes, Mr. Lewis, you're covered. Your payment isn't due until next week, but I do suggest you mail it in right away. Now I'll connect you with Mr. Menick, who will handle your claim. Hello, I'm Ed Reimers here at Allstate's Illinois Regional Office near Chicago. You have just seen a demonstration of one of the most remarkable communication systems in American business today. We call it Alert. Alert is a direct visual link between Allstate's many claims and service offices and this master policyholder record center. Its purpose? to make complete information instantly available to speed up all state claim handling. The heart of the alert system is this cylinder. Stored inside this one alone are more than 600,000 complete policyholder files on electrosensitive tape like this. Once again, here's how the system works. A call comes in to the lady on alert. She keys in the customer's insurance policy number. Instantly, the cylinder turns to select the file, and a split second later, all the pertinent facts flash on the operator's screen. She's ready to help. Right now, Alert is operating in most Allstate offices throughout the country, providing policyholders with even faster service and claim handling. Alert, a brand new reason why we say, you're in good hands with Allstate. Now back to Meet the Press, an unrehearsed press conference. 
Please remember, questions of the panel members do not necessarily reflect their own point of view. Here is our moderator, Neil Boggs. Resuming our interview, our guest today on Meet the Press is George C. Wallace, presidential candidate of the American Independent Party. You have just met Lawrence Spivak. The other reporters on our panel today are Claude Sitton of the Raleigh News and Observer, Peter Lissig Daily News, and Douglas Kiker of NBC News. We'll continue the questions now with Mr. Sitton. Governor, specifically, what concession should the United States obtain in return for a full bombing halt in Vietnam? Of course, I think they ought to <coughs> de-escalate the fighting in the South. Uh, they ought to stop terroristic activities toward the cities in the South and the capital of Saigon. Uh, uh, they ought to stop the infiltration of North Vietnamese regulars into the South. Those are some concessions that certainly they ought to grant for the secession of bombing. Now, if, if they uh, do not uh, grant, uh, they do not make any reciprocal agreement uh, for the stopping of the bombing, then I'm afraid the stopping of the bombing would, be in the, would not be in the interest of the health and lives of the American servicemen. There. How long would you give them to, to make those concessions, Governor? <clears throat> I think probably the, uh, the, the concessions ought to be made uh, uh, simultaneously with the stopping of the bombing. Uh, well, how long would you let the t Paris talks go on before you would res you would then go for a, a military victory? Well, I would say victory? if the Paris uh, do not evidence any sign of progress uh, by the beginning of the next administration, then uh, I think we ought to reappraise our position and recognize uh, the Paris peace talks for what they are, purely propaganda uh, on the part of the North Vietnamese, because the observations of General LeMay and what he saw is that they are not negotiating in good faith. I would uh, say that maybe even prior to the inauguration of the new administration, uh, this administration probably will uh, realize that they're probably not in good faith. But let me say that I hope and pray so, that they are in good faith, but observations at the moment show that they aren't. Mr. Lissagor. <coughs> Governor Wallace, uh, if you're elected president, would General LeMay be one of your principal military advisors? Well, I'm sure, sure he would be one of my principal military advisors, being a man who served honorably and well in our country's defense. Uh, he helped defeat the Noxes, and he helped defeat the fascists. Uh, he has uh, helped to uh, strengthen our nation against the communists, and uh, he is a brilliant uh, soldier. Uh, not that I would abdicate uh, the civilian responsibility of the presidency to the military, uh, the Joint Chiefs, or otherwise, but certainly General LeMay would be one of my advisors. Well, uh, let me... The reason I ask the question is that in your party platform, you say that if these peace negotiations fail, you're going to have to use military means. And That's that the correct. tactical employment of those military means will be left to the military. And I want to read one sentence from the platform that <clears throat> you say that you would favor destruction of the will to fight or resist on the part of the government of North Vietnam. Now, as I understand it, General LeMay favors the bombing of Haiphong and Hanoi. Would you, therefore, review the targets that uh, the military gave you, such as... Hanoi or Haiphong? Or Mr. Lizago, I word? think that uh, what you are referring to was written in a book by General LeMay some time ago, and I believe on Meet the Press, uh, maybe last week, he said that, of course, that book was written some time ago. I don't know whether he at the moment calls for bombing of Haiphong, but I believe he has said that Haiphong should be blockaded. Uh, we find uh, uh, flags of nations that are not only supposedly friendly with us, but who have received in the past foreign aid and help from us, uh, their flags bringing supplies and materials to the North Vietnamese. And what General LeMay is saying, and what I say, is that if we fail in Paris, uh, then we cannot stay there forever, and we must win the war. But the will to resist lies in Hanoi and that, Haiphong, That's Governor, correct. And your platform says you have to destroy that. I'm not going into the logistics or the strategy about how we would accomplish a military victory with conventional weapons if we fail. But if the North Vietnamese think they're going to get a better deal in the next administration if we are elected, they had better go ahead and negotiate now. Because if we fail, I again say, in Paris, we're going to win militarily. And I would, of course, lean upon the advice of the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff. 
I would not uh, say to you categorically that I would accept all of their advice. I would lean heavily upon them, never ab abdicating the uh, civilian responsibility to the military. But if we fail in these other fields, what other recourse is there? Mr. Caker. <clears throat> Governor, I think it's fair to say that you're one of the most controversial figures to appear in national politics in a long time. And there are those who say that if you were elected president, you'd find it impossible to govern the nation. Uh, I'd like to have your comments on this. Well, of course, those who oppose you uh, will say anything. Uh, I might point out that uh, uh, Mr. Humphrey has said that Alabama has the highest crime rate. And I find that uh, the FBI report shows that Minnesota has a higher crime rate than Alabama. Uh, I find that he uh, has made other statements that are equally uh, not correct. And so those who say that uh, uh, we cannot govern, I might say that uh, our country hasn't been governed too well in the last number of years. We have a balance of payment problem. We're about to go broke. Uh, we have anarchy in the streets of our country. Uh, we have a complete destruction of the right of local people uh, to determine local policies. We are bogged down in a no-win war in Asia. Uh, we have our friends trading with the enemies of our country. So I don't know that we've been governed too well in the last decade but or so. Looking from the, not to the past, but to the future, you would be dealing with a, a Congress which would be largely hostile to you. Would, could you really mount an administration that could govern this country? Mr. Could Kiker, you gain the people necessary? Mr. Kaika, in the first place, people love this country, and I would have no problem getting excellent top uh, people to serve in the cabinet of our country. Uh, the people of our country love it regardless of who happens to be president, whether they might agree with all that they say or espouse. But when you mention the Congress, let me say that most members of the Congress, in my judgment, feel as I do about the matters I've expressed. Our platform is not radical. Our platform is really uh, uh, basic and fundamental, uh, the fundamentals and basics upon which our nation was founded. And I would say that if I carry enough congressional districts and enough states that when the presidency, the members of the Congress are not going to come there the next day and oppose matters that really in their heart they happen to support. So I don't think we're going to have any trouble governing the country. I don't think a man in the Congress, because he's a Democrat or Republican, is going to try to top the government just because he doesn't like the man who is president. I think we have more patriotism and uh, more honor than that among members of the Congress. Mr. Spivak. <clears throat> Governor, law and order and crime on the streets has <clears throat> become one of the most important <clears throat> issues in this campaign, if not the most important domestic issue. Now, your critics say that when you were governor of Alabama, the crime rate increased by more than 42 percent against a national average of about 29 percent. Now, why do you think you're going to be able to reduce the rate of crime in the United States when you couldn't reduce it in Alabama? Well, Mr. Spivak, uh, no state could reduce the crime rate. You couldn't sustain a conviction in the Supreme Court. You can hardly make an arrest now as, de as a result of decisions of the court. But when you mention Alabama, I might say that uh, all states had an increase in the crime rate. And when you talk about the national average, you're talking about states such as Wyoming and Idaho and small populated states. But let me say to you that the crime rate by FBI reports show that Alabama's number 32. Not number 32. There are 31 states that have more crime in, than this does the state of Alabama. And I might say that Mr. Umphrey's state of Minnesota is number 23, and Mr. Nixon's former state of California is number one, and his now residence of New York is number two, and Mr. Agnew's state is number four of Maryland, and we find Alabama way down 32. So when Mr. Humphrey and the Republicans say we have the highest crime rate, they have misled the American people, and they've told them things that aren't true. And if Mr. Nixon would debate, as he recommended that we ought to debate in 64, and I wish you'd read the Saturday Evening Post article by Mr. Nixon in which he said that it's a duty on the part of presidential candidates to debate, and if they will debate, uh, the American people can watch and see how articulate they are and how they can... Uh, <clears throat> answer questions under fire, but of course he doesn't want to debate now. And I might point out that he did make such a statement and wrote an article during that year. So crime hasn't increased in Alabama, uh, other than it has increased, but it's increased in other states. But we are still number 32, and I think that's excellent. 
Yes, but, but Governor, why do you think <clears throat> you can do more as president than you were able to do as governor when you had well, a great, gov when you had police power? The governor power? doesn't have any authority or power on the court, the appointment of the Supreme Court justices of the United States. He doesn't have any power to make recommend recommendations to the American Congress. My election as president, in my judgment, is going to shore up the backbones of many mayors and governors in our country who have allowed law and order to break down. I'm going to ask the Congress to repeal some of the decisions of the court that have handcuffed the police. Uh, and uh, as governor, you do not have any such authority nor power as that. In fact, the governor of a state today is a high-paid ornament. He doesn't have any authority or power. It's been taken away by the federal courts. And uh, I would be in a more powerful position as president to offer my moral support to the law enforcement officials of the nation, and I would make the District of Columbia a model because we would have law and order here. Governor, in a speech you made in Missouri, you once said, and I quote, if police ran things for two years, we'd get these problems straightened out in the country. Well, How much discretionary power do you think the police ought to have? Well, Mr. Spivak, of course, uh, I was making a facetious remark uh, to personify and emphasize my strong support for the police in the country. The police do not want to run the country, nor the firemen. But if the police were allowed to enforce the law like they know how to enforce it, we wouldn't have the breakdown in the streets of our large cities. But politicians will not let the police enforce the law, nor will the courts. The police are the most abused people in our country. So I didn't mean turn the country over to the police, not at all. But I did say that to emphasize my strong support for law Do you think you can handle the situation simply by toughness of the police? and the courts, or do you think much more is necessary? Well, Mr. Spivak, the overwhelming majority of all people in this country are against the breakdown of law and order. And I want to say this. If I'm elected president, I believe four years from now, if I run again, I will receive half or more of the black voters of this country. Uh, they pass laws for them, but still, uh, most, uh, most of the Republicans and Democrats have contributed. There's been talk. Uh, and uh, so, in my judgment, uh, uh, we will have uh, law and order during the next four years, Governor, if I'm the president. On Mr. this question Senator. of law and order, you've been telling your audiences, and these are your words, you must obey the law and you must obey court orders, whether you like them or not. That's now, correct. does this apply to school desegregation, Governor? Does that do what? Apply to school desegregation yes, orders sir, we must. Uh, we must uh, obey all court orders, whether we like them or not. We, we Didn't you say as governor that I will never submit to an order of the federal court ordering the integration of the school system? I never made any statement to that effect. I said right here on Meet the Press prior to my stand at Tuscaloosa that as governor of Alabama, I'm going to raise a legal question to be adjudicated in the courts that I will not submit in the sense without resisting within the law. What? And so I stood to raise a legal question and said in advance over Meet the Press that we will abide by the result we must abide by the result, and we did abide by the result, and so I am not against the disobedience of court orders. It's the liberal in the country who says we can disobey the unjust laws and obey the just, right, and I do not agree with that. Wasn't your stay in the schoolhouse door the very essence of civil disobedience? No, sir, not at all. Uh, you cannot equate the governor of a state, not George Wallace. But when a man has been elected governor of his state as a sovereign of the state, as the chief executive, his raising a legal question to be adjudicated in the courts is not the same as a mob lying in the streets. And anyone who thinks that they are the same and can be equated really ought to go to a good law school because there's no analogy at all. And that's not civil disobedience in the sense that Mr. Fortas and others have recommended of uh, violating the law in mass by those who feel aggrieved. And those who have recommended that, including Mr. Nixon and Mr. Humphrey, by saying when these, when these uh, uh, movements started that they are good and glorious, have brought us to the brink of anarchy. So I have not, I had never have disobeyed any federal court order. If I had, why wasn't I tried for contempt? Gentlemen, just under three minutes, Mr. Lissagor. Governor Wallace, are there circumstances that you foresee under which you would go after the electors of Mr. Nixon and Mr. Humphrey go after them? Right. You, you mean to ask them to support me? Right. You mean in case uh, neither one of the parties receive a majority? That, that's right. Well, 
if that contingency arises, I would like to have the support of some of those electors in the Electoral College, and I'm sure that Mr. Nixon and Mr. Humphrey would also. But this is a purely hypothetical question, and frankly, I don't think it's going to arise. I think the election is going to be won on election day in that one of the candidates will receive a uh, majority of the electoral vote. Let me ask you a question again back to your platform, Governor. You said there that you would eliminate those programs and agencies that uh, serve only to harass and intimidate the business community. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you whether that means you would eliminate the federal regulatory agencies no, if elected president. I would uh, ask that HEW is one of those agencies that harass businessmen regarding their employment practices uh, as they harass schools. As you know, the 64 Act really attacked businesses and schools and other institutions, and HEW has written guidelines that transcend the law, and I would cut out uh, HEW harassing uh, business people in this country. They even go to different mills and check the shower baths and check the bathrooms, which is a harassment, and it's not uh, called for, and it's expensive, and that's what I had in mind mainly. Mr. Kiker. Governor, uh, back to Vietnam briefly. Mr. Nixon says that if President Johnson orders a bombing halt, that he'll support it. I gather you wouldn't, that you'd actively oppose it. Is that correct? If Mr. J if Mr. Johnson calls for a bombing halt, I will pray that he is correct. I care not who gets the credit. Will you back for him or not? Well, we will have to back the president in the sense that uh, if he calls it. So you wouldn't actively oppose a bombing halt? Well, I actively oppose a bombing halt unless we have some reciprocal uh, concession from the North Vietnamese that would not endanger the servicemen. But whatever action they take, I will hope and pray, and I will support the president by hoping and praying that it is correct, because I care less who gets credit. I want the war over honorably. Mr. Spivak, briefly. Uh, Governor, your running mate, General LeMay, believes that if this country is not prepared to use nuclear weapons when they are appropriate, we might as well bury them. Under well, what when you say... Under what circumstances, if any, would you use nuclear weapons? I hope we'll never have to think about nuclear weapons, but we are making them. And what I'm saying is, what he meant was that if the security and the existence of this nation depended upon it, he would use them. You would use them, too, if you were president and our country's security and also uh, actual existence depended upon Excuse it, me, and that's Governor, what he means. I'm sorry to interrupt, but our time is up. Thank you, Mr. Wallace, for being with us today on Meet the Press. I'll tell you about next week's guest in just a minute after this message. Welcome to Sperry Rand. We'd like to show you our line. Our Remington Rand electronic files store anything and find it in a hurry. At our new Holland division, we make hay balers and a lot of other farm equipment. Pilots use Sperry flight systems to fly hands off, even land in a fog. Vickers Hydraulic Systems. That's us, too. Among other things, they put the muscle in road graders. Our Univac computers have hundreds of uses, like reserving your seat or room in seconds. The Remington Electric Shaver shaves any beard from light to heavyweight, and anything in between. Well, that's us, Sperry Rand. We're synergistic, which means we do a lot of things, and we do each one better, because we do all the rest. Call us when you're in the market. Pa. For a printed copy of today's interview, send 10 cents in coin and a stamp self-addressed envelope to Merkel Press, Box 2111, Washington, D.C., 20013. Next Sunday on Meet the Press, our guest will be the Democratic presidential candidate, Hubert H. Humphrey. Now this is Neil Boggs saying goodbye for George Wallace and Meet the Press. Today's edition of Meet the Press was brought to you by Allstate Insurance Companies, the good hands people who find new ways to bring you better insurance protection. You're in good hands with Allstate. Whether it's the drama and excitement of an Apollo launch, the suspense of a presidential election, or the concise and accurate reporting by your local newsman, you can depend on NBC for the most complete and comprehensive analysis of world and national news. When it happens, you'll see it first on NBC. This is Lee Dayton speaking.